So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this wonderful planet. I um, would like to uh, welcome you on this uh, webinar. And actually, this uh, turns out to be the most popular webinar we had so far. The most number, the highest number of registered users. So, of course, we are excited to have you here. And of course, we want to thank you for spending your time today on this webinar for sure. And a subject that appeals to your interest. And let's switch to the uh, slides now. Um, a subject that appeals to your interest, a full stack application in less than one hour. And of course, um, quite normal with Delphi. So um, let's uh, embark on this uh, webinar. We are going to talk about full stack applications. And um, first of all, uh, let's uh, focus on uh, what we understand as being a full stack application is the separation between a client application and a an, uh, front end and um, the front end the client application and data that is managed uh, centrally on a typical back end server so we talk about the front end the client application and uh, the uh, back end application the database, the server that deals with the communication between the client application and the uh, database. If we talk about front end applications that can be web client applications and uh, as well, it can be native, also possibly cross platform uh, applications um, running on a mobile device or desktop device that does not uh, matter. And the backend that is typically a, a database where all the data is stored and the communication, the access to the database is enabled via a REST API server. If we lo look uh, from a Delphi developer perspective at uh, the front end, well, these days this can be a TMS web core web client application. It's an application built with object Pascal components, red uh, based, and um, this solution runs in the browser and will communicate to the backend. But it, as I explained, it can be as well native uh, VCL or FireMonkey uh, cross platform applications, applications that can run on an iOS, Android device, also on a desktop operating system. If we talk about backends, also today several solutions uh, exist to create backends with Delphi, mostly uh, with native code. Um, and uh, one of these solutions is uh, a solution that we have for quite some time already, which is TMS X Data. And you can also uh, couple that with TMS Sphinx. It's a very flexible, a very robust, solid uh, solution for building REST API servers and the authentication uh, that is uh, coupled to it. Another possibility for creating um, the REST API server is using the tool from Embarcadero, the Embarcadero Red server. And in addition to that, several other solutions exist, um, like, for example, it's a little bit uh, outdated these days, but it's still uh, something you can build with DataSnap that is part of uh, Delphi. There's also the open source Mars uh, framework, Mormot framework. And for sure, I'm uh, overlooking several other uh, open source or even commercial products that allow you to create a uh, REST API server with uh, Delphi. There are, of course, also non-Delphi solutions um, in the .NET area, the Node.js uh, based solutions. Uh, also, this is a, a possibility to create REST API servers. And a, a last one is uh, the usage of cloud services. So there are several cloud services that have as a purpose to uh, make access and work with data in the backend possible 
some of which listed here, but also this list is not um, limited. The, the number of solutions is not limited to this list, but some of the most popular ones, Google Firebase for sure, solutions that are based on Microsoft Azure. There is Fauna DB, and uh, we had a solution for quite some time, which is the MyCloudData.net. If we look uh, from the perspective of uh, building your backend uh, solution, your backend REST API server yourself, uh, several challenges come with that. Uh, of course, when you build a solution that way, you have the ultimate flexibility and control. You control up into the, the smallest detail, how it behaves, what endpoints you expose, etc. So certainly, uh, this has a purpose, but it comes with some challenges. It is, it can be quite complex to build. It can be quite time consuming to build. It needs to be separately tested. Uh, also, you face uh, dealing with the security, authentication, authorization uh, to build a real secure REST API uh, backend. Uh, in the case of Xdata, this comes with Sphinx that helps you a long way dealing with this but still, it has to be done. And then finally, of course, when you build such a solution yourself, it eventually needs to be deployed to a server that can be IIS, but also on the Linux side, uh, can be Apache or uh, Nginx, for example, several other servers uh, on which this can run, uh, but still might not be something that you're doing on a daily basis. And as such, um, be a little bit of a challenge uh, when you have to do this for the first time. In case you would use at this moment a cloud service as a backend for your data, um, many of these uh, existing cloud services are based on storing uh, JSON, JSON collections uh, on the server, not so not per se the relational data that we are typically familiar with when writing uh, multi-tier Delphi-based database applications. Costs, uh, definitely with a question mark. Several solutions come with several ways of calculating the cost, so that can certainly uh, give some kind of unpredictability on what the eventual cost of using such a service uh, will be. And of course, you are then still facing the challenge of building uh, your client that interfaces with that cloud service and um, dealing, for example, with handling all the errors that could come from uh, the, the communication, uh, deal with uh, offline situations, all these kind of things uh, are definitely uh, not the most trivial things to do, require some expertise uh, and some effort to do so. And that's why uh, today we want to introduce, that's the first uh, public reveal of a new solution we've been working on for uh, quite some time. And I uh, let you show our video that I created, especially for this, or better, our colleague uh, Gjald created this, of course, uh, StellarDS.io, a service that allows you to uh, create or use data in the cloud and um, have a lot of uh, advantages, flexibility in the process. So um, if we look at the key elements of a stellar data store.io, it is a relational data that is uh, offered as a service and it's uh, off offered as a cloud service. So that means obviously that there are no deployments to do from your side. You use it uh, straight from our service, StellarDS.io. It offers a web interface for configuring your metadata. So you set up your tables, fields, etc. You have a web interface for that, um, that you just do with uh, click and enter things, uh, no programming needed to do here. There is a role and permission control. That means that you can define your own roles for specifying what user has what permissions to do what on uh, specific tables or project fields, etc. 
It has built-in authentication, so you can decide how uh, your users will need to authenticate with the service to um, communicate with the backend. Um, we also offer a tight integration in the client application via a data set. So the key idea here is to uh, give you red development capabilities in the client to work seamlessly and transparent underlying with the REST API communication to the uh, service, but use something you are familiar with and it also easily binds to DB aware controls um, the data set concept that, of course, we all know for years in uh, the Delphi environment. Multi-tenant as a one-click configuration is also key in uh, StellarDS.io. So that means that with uh, one configuration, you can make your um, application multi-tenant. We'll come to that in more detail about uh, what it means to be a multi-tenant and how you uh, can configure it. Also, user access and roles management is built in. That means that you can or have full control over configuring which users have access to what and with what role users access a specific uh, data in your backend. It comes with various uh, data types out of the box, data types that uh, typically you will uh, want to use from a native Delphi application or Pascal code application, the data types you expect, like an integer, string, floats, um, date types, uh, time, uh, block fields, and uh, all these things. And also uh, crucial is a simple and pre predictable cost model. So no surprises. Uh, here, when it comes to uh, the usage of that service, uh, we have uh, chosen for a predictable uh, solution. And before actually diving into uh, the details of uh, the service, um, we want to do here live for you in this webinar a challenge, a challenge for looking at how fast we can create a web application with TMS Web Core, and how fast actually we can couple this to a backend created with um, StellarDS.io. And so um, I will um, tackle this challenge. It's live, everything can go wrong. So that's for sure a risk. Let's hope that Murphy is not around, but I think it's an interesting challenge anyway to just, before diving in all the details, give you an impression of how building a full stack application will become uh, when we have launched StellarDS.io. So to start with that challenge, we will uh, use our Delphi IDE. And actually, the purpose of this challenge is to create a web application that will manage Delphi books. So we will want to uh, perhaps store or, or manage our own Delphi book collection via a web application, a web application that you can use from any device everywhere. And therefore, we will want to uh, store Obviously, the author, I think, of the book, the title of the book, the publisher, the publishing date. And um, it's always nice to have a cover image for our book. So that's something we will also want to store in our uh, database. So how can we now create an application like this as a full stack web application with uh, StellarDS.io? First of all, we create, and before I do that, we will, of course, uh, set up the challenge and we will actually time uh, how long it will take us to create that application. Let me position this uh, timer tool for that uh, correctly. Okay, uh, position it here on top, give some more space to my object inspector and we are started. 
All right, so this will keep track of how long it takes me to create this application for you. So the first thing that I will do is actually store my application somewhere under projects, um, webinar, and let's give this a new folder, live. And so here my application will live. And what I will do is I will use a Stellar data store client data set. And if we talk about data sets, it's quite obvious that we will bind this via a data source to DB aware controls. And in this case, we will use a DB grid. And we will also use a DB navigator. Okay. And so obviously we will bind the navigator and the DB grid to our data source. We will bind the data set to our data source. And what I will also do here is use a pattern to uh, establish the connection. So here I enter connect. And at this moment on our Stellar DS cloud service, we do not have anything configured yet. We start really from scratch. So what we do is we right click on this uh, data set component. And here we have the Stellar Data Store Designer. I have in my connections here, in my connection settings, an access token. That access token will help me here in this case to connect to the uh, Stellar DS service uh, in this design. So I do connect. And you can see that the connection is established. You can see the tables that I currently already have on my account. And so as we start from scratch, we will need to create a new table for dealing with our Delphi books. Delphi books uh, table is the description, for example. OK, and we add this uh, table. Table is added. And we will need some uh, fields in this table to manage the data for our books. The author to start with, let's make this a string field with 50. We need a title of the book and let's make it easy. Also the same size. We will need a publisher. We also want to start the date when this book was published and that will be a date time field we add it and then finally we also want to uh, store the cover image of our book that's always nice to see our book visually and that's it actually that's uh, now in the back without uh, seeing this here but actually at this moment with doing these steps my uh, Data, my table is configured at stellards.io. What you can also see, if I open the fields editor, it has already added automatically all the fields that I added to my table. So what do I need to do more for, for doing the connection? I need to uh, define the access token. And to make my um, web application use my uh, access token to access the service. So fortunately, Delphi 12 has these long strings. It can handle it without any issue. Uh, what we can also see here is that uh, the table name was automatically set to the table that I selected uh, for my uh, data set. What I will also do is um, make the font a little bit bigger. That is also helpful. Um, uh, what more do we do? I set um, the editing. I enable editing and column sizing on my grid like this. That's the DB grid. And uh, 
what I do when I, after I have set my access token is make the data set active. So let's see what this is doing. And this is my Chrome browser. I connect to uh, the uh, data, the connect the data set, and I think I must have overlooked uh, connecting the data source to my DB navigator. So that's why I could not yet insert any data into my um, DB grid. So let's try this again. Connection is made. And now I can insert a new record and let's insert, for example, the first book from Marco Cantu and a recently uh, released book. It was the book originally written actually by uh, Pavel Glowacki, uh, published on PACT. And I remember that it was released in February 24. And here I uh, put this information into um, the DB grid. Let's add another book. Also a book I'm very familiar with is a book from Holger Flick, our colleague, about modern uh, Delphi development. Like this, and this was published independent. And it was published somewhere in uh, December, let's say 15 December, could be a little bit different than that, but it will not be too far off. And then, of course, my all-time favorite book from Ray Lishner, and still contains so much useful information, Hidden Paths to Delphi Tree. And the publisher of that book was Informant. Okay. And I can make it a little bit more clear by sizing the column and the DB grid like that. And that's basically it. We are seven minutes uh, working and we already have a first version of a DB or a database or a full stack web application. So when I connect again, you see that all the data that I had is um, in our uh, DB grid. Let's make this a little bit more uh, visually appealing. And I will add for that a web file upload component to my application. And I will also add a web image control. And that's, of course, the, its purpose is to uh, show the book covers and allow us to upload the book covers in our uh, Stellar DS data in the backend. So what I will do is I will actually change the height style of um, the uh, image to automatic. That means that the width is fixed, height is automatic, so my image will be um, stretched with um, aspect ratio. It will keep the aspect ratio, but at least it will uh, adapt automatically. So what I do in the uh, file dropper area here, uh, I will implement the undropped files event. That event is triggered when uh, a file is dropped or a file is picked actually. Um, on this uh, area. And I expect that I will have at least uh, one file when this event is dropped. Um, and when I get that file, I will ask to retrieve that file uh, as an array buffer. So that's an array of bytes. That's the concept in JavaScript. Uh, and so from this event, I start the process to uh, retrieve the file as array buffer. And uh, this, this is an asynchronous process. That means that when that is ready, it will trigger the on get uh, file as array buffer. Then at this point, my array buffer is filled with the data of the file that was dropped. And what I can do here is, uh, first of all, uh, I can show the image in the image control by 
loading the image from the array buffer. And this is my access to that array buffer. And what I will want to do from here is actually um, put the image, the image data into the cover block field. And that is something that I can do with my data set. And here I can do write blob. The cover is the field where I want to write it. And you can see that it is an overload. It has different types. In this case, I chose to uh, upload it via an array buffer. So that's what's happening when I dropped the file here in this area. And what I also want to do is uh, when my record changes in the uh, data set, and I will implement this from on after scroll. I want to retrieve the uh, image from the block field and display it in the image control. To do that, I do the following. I will want to get the image data as an array buffer. So I declare here an array buffer. And I will perform a re and read from that block field from the data set. Um, okay, uh, I will copy and paste this uh, data set. Uh, read block as array buffer from, of course, the cover field. And you can see that I'm using an await here. This, this is because um, the read blob as array buffer that needs to perform an HTTP request to the service to get the um, image as uh, bytes. And of course, that takes some time. That's an asynchronous process. That's why I'm using await. And when I'm using await, I need to indicate in the via an attribute that this is an asynchronous function that can use uh, await. And when I have retrieved um, the array buffer, what I do is I check if um, the length of my array buffer is different from zero so that I got some actual data. And when I do so, then I know that I can actually uh, load this array buffer into my image like this. And so with these uh, few extensions, I should be able to um, also involve book covers into my web application. So here we have uh, this um, application. And I know that I have somewhere here uh, the images with the book covers. So what I can do here is the book from Marco. I drop it here in this area. You can see that it has been displayed in the image. We go to Holger and I drop the Holger book into the area. And finally, I move to uh, Ray Lishner and I drop this book. When I now scroll into my DB grid, I see uh, the image that was stored in the cover field in um, the Stellar DSIO service. And as you can see, in uh, 13 minutes, I will stop the timer. It took me 13 minutes. And let's see uh, the number of lines of code. That's two lines, uh, three, four, five, and then um, another, let's say, five lines of code. So in approximately 10 lines of code and 13 minutes, I have a working full stack web application developed in WebCore and consuming the Stellar DS um, service. All right. I think that is uh, for Delphi developers, uh, some impressive numbers. Uh, definitely, if you want to compare this with other people doing web applications with other technologies, that uh, this will be very hard to match that number. All right, so that was our first demo. Now you have seen the concept, the ideas of how we think you can uh, be really productive 
to create full stack web applications. Now let's have a closer look at uh, how uh, Stellar Data Store works, what it offers, uh, and have a look at uh, detail. So first of all, we'll have a look at the application setup, what the possibilities are, how we can configure our tables, users, roles, and permissions. And for that, we are navigating to the um, Stellar DSIO website. And so here I'm logged in, I can go to manage database. And here you can see the options available to you. You can see that here in my overview, I'm on the uh, enterprise tier. So all possibilities are open. That means I can deal with 20 tables, 100 users. My last activity is locked. And you can see that, of course, uh, I did much more then only create today's application. But so far, I did already 745 requests. Let's go to the application tab, because maybe logically that comes first. And here you can see that there are actually two ways to um, use uh, the Stellar DSIO service. First uh, way to use it, recommended way, secure way, is via OAuth. So then you will authenticate and authorize via the typical uh, pattern of OAuth with the Stellar DSIO service. And after authentication, you will obtain the uh, access token. And with the access token, you can perform all requests. You can see here several uh, OAuth applications that I created. The role that I assigned to uh, these um, OAuth applications. Also, the callback URL is also typically configured. And you can see here the client ID. There is also a client secret that's not supposed to be seen. That's also not supposed to be stored. You will get it when you create a new application. You pick it up. You store it in a safe way in um, your uh, application. And uh, then you can use it to uh, perform the OAuth authentication. An alternative way is to uh, use access tokens. So um, access tokens allow you to access the service without any uh, user authentication authorization. Can be safely used when, for example, you use uh, native um, applications where it's, uh, this access token is uh, securely stored. Um, but you can also uh, use it in uh, other applications, certainly as the use of access token can be coupled with domain locking. So as you can see here, you can uh, specify the uh, domain from where um, the uh, access token is used. And you can also define the role that your access token will assume when it is being used. For example, uh, you could create an application that has an access token with a read-only role that um, will need no user interaction to immediately obtain data from your uh, database, but um, where your write operations, uh, update operations, or whatsoever uh, will then, for example, need to be uh, using an access token that was obtained via OAuth. So these possibilities exist, and it's all a matter of choosing the right option, the safe option, the secure option for your purposes and your needs. Let's have a look now at tables. As you can see, this is uh, the collection of tables that I have at this moment already uh, configured. And you can see here the uh, Delphi books table is the table that was actually created on the fly. Um, here during my live demo. If I go to manage table, you can see the fields that I have created here in this session. And you can also see the data that I entered uh, today in uh, the live uh, demo. I created everything with the default permissions, meaning that uh, I act actually for my access token, I chose to have admin per permissions so I could read right into uh, this uh, table. And, and so you can see actually here in permissions that you have um, 
also a table level uh, different options to control the uh, permissions. When we have a look at users, so uh, you can also manage uh, multiple users and invite other users to access your data with the permissions that you specify, permissions that are defined by the role assigned to the user. So you can see that I have here uh, three users. And so uh, this data that I have in my tables is accessible uh, for these three users. And you can see with uh, different roles. And I can add additional users by inviting them uh, from here. And finally, also roles and permissions. You can see that uh, by default, there are three roles, the admin role, the user role, and the read-only role. You can create new roles where you can uh, actually uh, configure these permissions all yourself. Like, for example, read-only permissions, like uh, the ability to create or not create tables, uh, all these uh, kind of things uh, are configurable. And so if you need a role with some different characteristics than the three default ones that are here available, you can do that with uh, the create new role and manage the roles this way. And so that's uh, basically a uh, overview of what you can do with the web interface for StellarDS.io. Now we can do uh, pretty much all these things also via the REST API. That means that we will be able to uh, create tables, um, ask uh, information about the tables we have, create fields or get field information. Of course, work with the data in uh, these tables, work with users, and finally also uh, manage or deal with uh, the authentication. So. Let's have a look at the uh, REST API that is available to do all these things. So we go under documentation and Swagger is the documentation for our REST API. And here you can see the endpoints that are um, all dealing with data. So here we will typically uh, perform uh, REST API calls to get data from a specific table in our um, Stellar DS account. Posting is to add new records to a table, delete records, update records, uh, dealing with blob data. And that's some, something uh, interesting to um, specify. That is that the blob information is not automatically uh, returned when getting records uh, from the table. That's for a very good reason that is to uh, keep the performance high and only uh, allow you to um, get the blob data on demand when you really need it. Imagine that you have a, a table of 10,000 records with a blob field. It would not be so desirable to return the actual blob data for these um, 10,000 records in one time. That would create a huge uh, amount of data to return in a um, HTTP request. So blob uh, fields are by default um, retrieved on demand via a special URL. And with that URL, you can get the blob data, but also by doing a post, uh, update uh, or load the data in that blob field. And of course, deleting records, uh, deleting the entire table is also possible from here. Field management, so here you can uh, retrieve information about these tables, what fields are in this table. You can also add specific fields, change things in uh, fields, and also delete fields uh, from here. Out specific functions, these are um, endpoints that deal with the access token and refresh token, revoking access tokens, etc. So. Um, these are the things that you need to implement um, to uh, obtain a secure access and also use the uh, refresh token 
when your access token has re uh, expired, you can implement your own scheme of um, refreshing automatically, uh, allow of forcing the people to re-authenticate. Um, this is uh, possible. Project, everything is in a project. So as you can see here, um, when I go to uh, my overview, I'm here in my Bruno's project. So that's the project under which all my tables and fields are um, configured. And you and this project has a unique ID. And uh, it is with that ID that you get to the data within that project. Eventually, you could have multiple projects um, and identify the projects with this uh, ID. And then uh, table management. From here, you can uh, retrieve the list of tables you have, post data into a table, uh, update tables, delete tables, etc. There's also a test endpoint and then an endpoint to get information about users uh, that are coupled to your account. So that is what you can do with the REST API endpoints if you are uh, endeavoring to um, perform all HTTP requests yourself. But that's, of course, uh, that's good to have, but that's not required to have as we offer uh, solutions where you do not need to worry about performing these HTTP requests to the endpoints. And that is in two ways. In uh, TMS WebCore, we have the Web Stellar Data Source Client Dataset. And that will, of course, underlying uh, use the REST API endpoints. But you just work with your data in StellarDS.io by performing insert, post, updates, uh, all these kinds of typical things you are used to uh, when working with a client data set. And when wanting to use that in a native application, be it a VCL application or a FireMonkey cross-platform application, we will also add this to the FNC Cloud Pack as the TMS FNC Stellar Data Store data set. WebCore 2.5 was released this morning. So um, people wanting to explore how this can be used in connection with TMS WebCore Web Client Applications can do it from WebCore 2.5, where these components are now included, out of the box available. We will shortly also release a new version of the FNC Cloud Pack where this uh, new data set component will be included, as well as classes for making it easy to work with the REST API. And that will allow you to create uh, actually native applications that also use um, the data from StellarDS.io. To show that actually how that works, uh, I can also, that's not, that's the right IDE that I want to use. Uh, so let's close this application and to save some time, uh, let me see. Uh, I think I will be able to use this project. So this is a VCL application and this has the our internal test version of the um, data set, the Stellar data, sort, uh, data Store data set coupled to a uh, Stellar data store connection. And the data set is bound via data source to a DB navigator and a DB um, grid in this case. And here we have actually made the coupling via um, an OAuth cycle. So uh, what I have here is the configuration of my connection where I have my client ID, a secret, and a callback URL. I also inform the uh, data set that it uses the cars table, and I have set the project ID. So to focus here, when I go to manage database, and I go to tables, I have the cars table, go to manage, and here you can see the data that is in this table, right? And under applications or out, I have here, I just, this must be these uh, credentials. 
from the FNC application uh, that I have uh, configured. And the only thing that I will need to do is stop this uh, web server because it's on the same port 8000. And the only thing that I actually do is activating the data set. So when I run this application, okay, I perform connect. Then I'm going through an OAuth cycle. So that means I'm logging in right now uh, on the Stellar DS service. And after login, you can see that uh, the DB grid was filled with all the records from my uh, cars table in uh, Stellar DS. You can also see actually that it's live. I think Labergini Euros can do more than 250, maybe 295. I'm not sure, but let's see. And if I go now uh, here in my tables, under cars, manage uh, data, we see that uh, I updated this to 295. So this is uh, via this DB grid and the data set working live on the data here on StellarDS.io. So that is how from a native application, this is also usable. And then the topic of uh, multi-tenant. So multi-tenant actually means that um, as an application developer, you can have uh, multiple users using your application, using the data in the backend, without worrying yourself about the user management. In other words, each user will have access to his own data. So via the authentication, the service knows what user is being using the service and uh, a user will this way only see his own uh, data. Can be configured at project level. That means that every data in your project automatically becomes multi-tenant or it can also be configured at a table level. To show you this in effect, uh, let's move to the account tables. And here I actually have a, a contacts table that I have configured as being multi-tenant. So if I go to manage data, you can see here the data in uh, this contacts table. And I have a, a web core application that is configured to uh, use this multi-tenant uh, table. So I open it and it, actually this demo is also included when you are uh, updating to WebCore 2.5, you will find these demos, these new demos in um, the folder with all demos. And I take this example here. Okay. And I think, yeah, of course, of course. I'm using the wrong IDE. I started by accident Delphi 11, but I should, of course, stick to uh, Delphi 12 and open this demo where everything is uh, properly configured. So context demo, and here you can see our data set. And you can, if I look at the uh, code, you can see here that I have uh, an, a client ID and a secret and a callback URL uh, set. And that means that the users will authenticate uh, with the application and each user will deal work with his own uh, data. Let's start the application to give you an idea first of uh, how it works. So here you can see that I have my client ID and secret uh, configured. I perform the connection and I'm going through an authentication and authorization cycle. So this is the login with my personal account. And you can see that I have in my contacts at this moment, uh, three people added. When I close this um, connection and I reopen it, and instead, I will authenticate with a user 
that I actually invited. Remember, you might have seen it in the invite to users list. And I perform the login. You can see here that I have uh, two other contacts that are uh, in the scope of um, the other user. If I add now uh, a new uh, user here, customer Z with uh, Z at Z.com, and one, two, three, four, I have updated. Okay, I will close, open again use it from my personal account you still see the three people in my contacts list and when i go back to the other account and that was coupled to info at tmssoftware.com you can see the three users coupled to that account and from an application level actually you do not need to do anything um, this is automatic uh, when you have configured your uh, table for multi-tenant usage that does not change a thing to your application the only thing that you have to do is actually um, um, perform the authentication uh, through OAuth, and the user identifies itself via OAuth, and then uh, the proper data for the proper user will be uh, dealt with um, one small interesting uh, thing uh, that I wanted to uh, show you in this uh, particular demo. Um, let me have a look where um, this snippet of code is actually uh, created. Um, here I have my data set here. So I have configured my data set and I think uh, here, table name is contacts. Suppose that this contacts table does not yet exist. So when I want to make the connection to the contacts table and it is not found on the service, the event on table not found will be triggered. And from that event, what I'm doing here is um, I use the uh, API of Stellar DS to create that table. So here the table is newly created. What I'm doing that after it has been created, I'm retrieving all tables from the service. I get access to the table with the new table name that I want to create. And what I'm doing now is configure three fields in this table. What I'm trying to show you is that when you create a project you give it to a customer you can make it self-initializing this way uh, when this uh, customer has a stellar ds account and in the very first use of the application the table does not exist this is a possible way to automatically configure uh, his stellar ds account with the tables needed for your application all right, so this was about um, multi-tenant. Another uh, thing, interesting thing to look at is server-side uh, specifications on uh, the data that you will retrieve. Um, so three things are possible. This is defining joints, joints between tables. And this is the specification that you will use both in uh, the REST API when you use the, the endpoint yourself uh, or also at the data set level, the data sets that you have in web core and in native applications. So uh, this is how you can specify the joints. Filtering, you can do server side filtering. Normally the data set of course can client side perform filtering, but it can be for performance reasons better to perform server side filtering. And this is how you can specify this server-side server filtering by a series of conditions, field name conditions, for example, larger than, smaller than, equal, etc., and then the value on which you will uh, filter. And the same applies to uh, sorting. And so to uh, make that clear how you can use that with the endpoints, if we go to the documentation under Swagger, 
and we do the get from get data from the table. You can see here that the optional request parameters are the join query, the where query, and the sort query. And that is also exposed in the data set component where you have the properties, the table join query, sort query, and where query. So same specific specification can go directly on the data set itself. And then uh, also uh, about blob fields, as I mentioned, blob fields, the data coming from blob fields is not automatically retrieved when retrieving data for records. You actually get a unique URL for a blob field and you can perform in get to get the blob data a post to post the blob data. Uh, I have a an, uh, an, uh, pet project that I also wanted to show you today in this uh, live demo, a pet project that shows you an, an other way, just like we use it for the covers, but just a slightly uh, different way to use uh, blob fields. What we have here is a um, web client application, of course, created with web core with a fixed access token. And we will connect to a small table that um, has some interesting information. I'll run the application and you will immediately see what it is about. So this is the application. What we see here in the bottom part is um, leaflet maps. So that is a fully free uh, mapping service. And uh, with this uh, access token, I get access to my uh, bike rides table on Stellar DS. And you can see the date of the bike ride and the description. And when I do now show uh, route, you can see here, uh, actually, uh, this is the visualization of the GPX file that was generated for that bike ride and other uh, bike rides I can simply um, show this way on the map. And I can actually also um, add new bike rides. So add for ex let's add, for example, another bike ride that would be the, the Alter Eclo bike ride. So it's added to the service. And now I will load uh, this um, into the and that's not the one. Let's quickly move to the right place where it is stored. Here and here. And this is the GPX file that I have for this bike ride. And you can see that it got loaded and also visualized immediately on leaflet maps. And this is by now nicely stored on Stellar DS. And a GPX file is actually an XML file. So that means that when I uh, load the route, we have the open dialog that picks the GPX file. And we have a kind of same mechanism where uh, if we get, uh, if we have opened or selected the file, then we perform get file as text because XML is a text file. And when we have retrieved the uh, text file, the content of the XML, we use this uh, write blob to uh, write it to the GPX blob field on Stellar DS. And what I also do is show the GPX on uh, the leaflet map. And let's have a look at the show GPX function. This uh, is the XML GPX information. And here we retrieve the coordinates of that route from the GPX file. Uh, with this uh, built-in function of uh, TMS Web Core GPX to coordinates that returns an array of all coordinates of the route. What I do is take the first point and actually set the center of the map to that first point, the longitude and latitude of that first point. And then eventually I set here uh, as a polyline the array of points along 
um, my uh, road in the GPX file. So that's how easy it is to do something similar to that. All right. And then let's come to um, what we have in mind for uh, offering you as uh, the Stellar DS uh, data store service four tiers, a free one, a basic one, a pro one, and an enterprise one. And basically the difference, it will be based on the number of tables you have av uh, available. The free will not have the block field. Uh, the others will have the block field. Um, the availability of user management and the availability of the multi-tenant functionality, and of course, also the number of requests per month. And this important to remark is subject to change for release uh, we are now starting first of all the closed beta we want to feel for what you will want to use it uh, we want to get your feedback that's very important and to adapt uh, the models that will fit you best um, for the stellar ds io service so our roadmap is the following. Closed beta is starting from today. You can actually uh, register to uh, participate in the closed beta that goes from the Stellar DS websites. Here you can see uh, sign up for closed beta where you uh, enter your information. And um, this way you can uh, sign up for it. Um, Important here is at your motivation. We will obviously uh, want um, people uh, who really use the service and who really provide us useful feedback to get it as robust, solid as possible on one side to get the features right on the other side. So um, a good communication, actual use um, is very important during the first phase that is the closed beta. After uh, the closed beta, which we estimate will take about uh, one to two months, you will also have the full capabilities, the enterprise tier during this closed uh, beta. Um, and after that, it will depend on your feedback, we will move to a public beta and we estimate that we will also need one to two months um, to um, monitor, to get your feedback and to adapt uh, everything. And then, of course, when this uh, period is uh, gone, then we come to an uh, official release. What we also have in the roadmap, what we did not show you today, um, is the personalization of the login screen so that you can adapt the login screen to fit with the look and feel of your application, have the company logo, etc. Uh, sign up via services. Actually, we already have that uh, working, but we disabled that functionality for the closed beta because otherwise uh, anyone with a Google, Facebook, Microsoft or Apple account could uh, start using the service. But when we go to the public beta phase, that of course, uh, fun that functionality will be uh, enabled. And the invite and sign up um, process will also um, become available from the public beta phase. Uh, it's also quite logical that uh, invites in a closed beta period uh, would not really uh, adhere to the closed beta principle. But that is uh, roughly what we have in mind for the coming months. And so this was what I wanted to show you today. Um, I've personally never been as uh, enthusiastic about the productivity that um, I can obtain creating web client applications, but also creating mobile applications that deal with uh, data in the cloud. Uh, so I hope uh, you like it as much as I like it myself personally. And let's see now in the chat for uh, questions that might have come up during this webinar. Uh, so I can um, answer these. And let me scroll back. My colleague um, Bradley and um, Gjeld are actually also um, assisting in the chat box to answer your uh, questions. 
So let me see what we still need to go over. Um, I see here references to uh, my cloud data. So several years ago, we started the my cloud data service uh, that is uh, on a daily basis in use by several users. Uh, and for sure, it, it was um, at, at some point uh, our consideration, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to um, start from mycloud.data.net and bring it to a version 2.0? Or is it, will it be better to uh, re-architect everything from the ground up with everything we learned from that uh, experience? and start from scratch, start something with um, many more capabilities in mind, capabilities that also um, were reaching us via feedback from users. We thought uh, starting from a clean sheet would be the better way um, to re-architect it, to have a really solid basis and to have really the feature set that we felt and heard from you, uh, you wanted. And so that's why um, we leave for now my cloud data as is. And uh, let's consider the version 2.0 of my cloud data as, as tellrds.io. You're actually pretty confident that if you are using uh, mycloud.data.net today, um, you will find it easier, faster, more performant with more capabilities in Stellar DS. And so that transitioning should be smooth. We also have actually in the demos uh, that are today already included in WebCore, a, a Stellar DS importer application so that allows you to import uh, data. So if you have your data from my cloud data or from any other uh, source in a CSV file, in a JSON file, uh, you will be able with that demo app to import it right away into Stellar DS. So we are quite confident that the transitioning will be smooth. But for now, of course, during the beta phase and even a long time after that, um, this service is stable, is up and running. Uh, it does what it needs to do, but we are convinced that the features of Stellar DS will want you to eventually uh, move to it uh, at some point. Let me have a look for other uh, questions here. Is there a notification service for table and record changes? At this uh, point, not, but this is an interesting suggestion. This is also something, uh, notifications uh, that we plan for uh, future versions of uh, Stellar DS. Uh, the website for the pro version states a limit of 50 tables per field. That seems far too low. Is it correct? As I mentioned in my slides, this is the tentative proposal, the very specific uh, one of the needs of our uh, beta cycles is to get feedback from you uh, what your requirements are. Nothing is set in stone yet, so we will hear your feedback and we will um, shape the, the models to fit your needs uh, best. Will all access users have full use of the new Stellar service without any extra charges? Uh, that will not be the case. Um, we will, of course, offer you all the uh, components to make um, communication with Stellar DS as uh, easy and as um, seamless as possible, but as Stellar DS will offer different models um, that will not be an automatically offered free service for all access users. All right, I see um, also questions about the speed of the service. Um, well, um, of course, the beta period is the period where you can judge. We have architected everything for um, with the goal of uh, delivering the maximum performance. Um, we are eager to learn how you experience the performance during the beta cycle. 
and of course we will do everything in our capabilities to uh, further fine-tune if a need would arise uh, for that about costs nothing has been set in stone yet about uh, costs the most important thing is that it will be a simple and an um, and a fixed cost model so the, the most uh, important thing we want to offer you is a service without surprises uh, also here um, the three tiers nothing is set in stone yet and it will also be important uh, during the beta phase uh, to get in touch with you and uh, feel uh, what is uh, acceptable reasonable uh, versus of course the cost on our side to maintain all these uh, servers code etc um, what more questions um, i can't test it without all data access uh, during the beta we will not have odata uh, that is something for consideration uh, at a later point in time will there be any service level guarantees on server av availability yes um, in the um, when we release it uh, after the beta phase we will of course um, uh, offer you an sla uh, with a um, guaranteed um, availability of servers and service um, any further aurelio aurelius plans for stellar ds um, i actually will need to check that uh, if we uh, can create also um, aurelius access aurelius data set that will uh, underlying uh, connect to um, stellar ds um please consider a developer tier uh, that's an interesting suggestion of course yes sure um at this moment uh also important to note is at this moment uh, the login on stellar d is is based on um, either your own uh, username and password or e email and password or uh, login via um, service like google facebook uh, microsoft apple um, also under consideration in, in planning is to look at things like uh, passkey and uh, two-factor authentication um, okay did your table support foreign keys uh, key management is also in uh, the pipeline at this beta phase uh, not yet and okay i think i will have handled uh, most of the ah will you provi provide a way to host the websites that access your new service i'm not 100 percent sure how to uh, understand that question um, if your question is um, self-hosting the Stellar DS uh, service, uh, that is uh, definitely something uh, we understand that some people might want and uh, that we at some point um, can consider to offer as a, uh, as a separate product. But in, initially, the goal is actually to save you from all the deployment hassles and use the service right away uh, as it is hosted by us i see at uh, this moment uh, no not immediately questions uh, that were not handled uh, for sure um, i would suggest to uh, sign up for the uh, beta and uh, have a lively communication during the beta phase as i mentioned if you um, get the latest web core version 2.5 today you will get all the things you need from the client side also the demos that are included so that will help you uh, to start with this right away 
On the other side, with, in terms of FNC Cloud Pack for use from native applications, um, we are working hard on finishing an update for the FNC Cloud Pack as well. We expect it to be available in the next few weeks. And from that point on, you will also be able to use it in a very seamless way um, and, and create um, applications with a minimum amount of code that use this uh, central data from uh, native VCL or FMX uh, applications. Um, what more do I see? Can Stellar DS emit events to connected clients? I think that was asked previously, notifications on our uh, list in this phase of the beta, not yet. And is the service hosted in Belgium or in Germany? Uh, at this starting point, it is hosted in uh, Germany. Um, but that is the starting location. And that is, of course, subject to change as we grow. All right, I think um, most questions have been uh, handled with this. And indeed, I see Gjald uh, very good. Gjald, that you uh, mentioned it. Uh, any further questions, of course, you can ask uh, via email, info at stellards.io. This is where you can reach us with uh, specific questions to StellarDS.io. And of course, if you use um, StellarDS.io in connection with WebCore, in connection at uh, very soon uh, with FNC Cloud, uh, you can of course also um, ask questions in the support center in the WebCore uh, category or in the FNC Cloud category. A uh, question here is, is there a recording of the webinar available? When everything went well, we will indeed have a recording and we will send out an email from uh, with the details where you can watch the recording. So only a little bit over time this time for uh, the webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, you are uh, as excited as I am. Uh, for creating um, web applications, uh, mobile client applications with a really seamless, low-code way to um, deal with uh, central data in uh, the cloud. So be in touch. We'll follow up, uh, follow our social media channels, follow our blog, where we will publish information as it comes becomes available. And for now, have a good remainder of the day, be in touch, uh, be well, and uh, enjoy coding in uh, Delphi. See you in a next webinar. Bye-bye.